All right, everyone, welcome back to the Digital Currency Summit. I'm here with Colin Miles, the Chief Commercial Officer of Zillica. Uh, Colin, welcome to the Digital Currency Summit. Thanks, Aaron. Great to be here. Great to have you. Thanks so much for waking up early over there in Singapore, uh, one of my favorite countries in the world, uh, one of the best places to be in crypto. Um, totally. So you are over there in Singapore. Unfortunately, isolated in your own little tiny island as, you know, we still try and work our way out of the pandemic, but that's okay because there's lots of work to be done. And Zillica is one of the companies that has done a lot of work ever since their inception. Uh, so give us the high level overview uh, for all the new people that are just coming into the crypto space. What is Zillica? What is your mission? What are you guys not trying to build? What have you guys built already? Well, certainly we've been on mainnet uh, since 2019, and we've built uh, public blockchain, which was the first to use sharding as a technology to increase transactions per second, trying to solve the bottleneck problem, which obviously was clear from Ethereum and, and Bitcoin at the time. And uh, we've built on that uh, successively for the last couple of years and now aggressively going into the so-called DeFi space, which has been uh, interesting to watch and uh, seeing the community grow massively, the usage increase dramatically too. And uh, yeah, we, we just passed 21 million transactions on the blockchain. Wow, congratulations. Uh, that's amazing. So is it time to just kind of kick up your heels and relax a little bit, or do you guys have even more work that you're still doing? Well, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> talk about interoperability. And of course we have uh, an Ethereum bridge being built out at the moment. This is uh, something we're all very excited about because it looks at the transfer of assets from the Zillica blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain uh, bi-directionally. So a two-way transfer of assets from those two chains. Fantastic. As far as DeFi goes, how do you determine whether a project is successful or getting adoption? Because there may be less transactions, but there could be more value locked up inside it. Um, how do you weight success? Well, with our Zillswap platform, of course, we've uh, reached the 1 billion uh, total assets locked, total value locked. And that's something which is a good benchmark for a, a startup uh, DEX. And we're looking at how to improve and develop new services into the DEX environment. And that includes something like an initial launch offering, an ILO, which uh, can leverage this technology to raise funds for other projects. That's fantastic. So what's remaining on your roadmap for 2021? Well, of course the bridge is an ongoing project so that will continue to build out for 2021. We are as a company growing quite significantly. So we're doing a lot of hiring. Uh, our focus of course is on the creator economy. So we've seen this huge shift in momentum towards NFTs. NFTs a little bit of jargon, an acronym but it helps people really understand what the blockchain can do the value of an asset when it is certified, verified, and provable. And I think that uh, not just in terms of the creator economy, artists, um, and even sports people, you know, celebrities, everyone is going to be getting involved in NFTs going forward, including enterprises. So we have also a focus on enterprise services. And that's something which is going to be very exciting to see how businesses take to the use of NFTs. So the broad sweep of the creator economy moves all the way into the metaverse. I'm sorry, more jargon, but uh, there are a lot of touch points now for integration and uh, the movement of assets cross chain uh, using NFTs. So if I wanted to move a Zillica based token over to Ethereum, would I just kind of go through a wrapping process at some custodian or where would I go? to be able to transfer assets even from Ethereum into the Zillica network? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, at the moment, we are just using uh, a wrapping mechanism, uh, but we will have uh, simultaneous uh, minting, uh, which will lock assets on the Ethereum chain and release them into the Zillica chain and vice versa. And that's awesome. And in fact, I think that way of doing things is what's going to allow Bitcoin to act at scale and to be used as cash someday across many different chains. It's not going to be restricted to its own chain, which it is now. 
except for final settlement. But every transaction doesn't require that. So I think you're going to see Bitcoin across many different chains, perhaps even Zillica. Yeah, we've uh, um, announced there will be a WBTC, of course. Fantastic. Let's talk a little bit more about the business use case and enterprise use case, because that's something we have not seen in crypto, really. If I want to pay my employees in crypto, maybe there's one or two services. But if I want to manage accounts and I would need robust reporting and I need enterprise grade security where, you know, it's not just me that has a private key shard, but it's got to be everyone on the board of directors or accounting or, you know, the IT department needs to be able to buy, you know, the things that they need. There's nothing like that out there. Which use cases for business are you guys building out tools for first? Well, we've started fairly early with the HTX, which is our securitization platform. So that's enabling uh, capital, capital to be unlocked. So we can uh, use tokenization to enable uh, investors to get involved in, uh, for example, pre-IPO share offerings. Uh, they can also potentially invest and become fractional owners of things like football clubs. So there's a whole range of um, models for unlocking capital in the business environment. And there are also financial institution, sorry, instruments, uh, bonds, for example, for people to raise money and to drive their own businesses in a different way from the marketplace supporting them. So we're quite interested in that structural way of unlocking capital. In terms of day-to-day uh, -day business, you're right. Uh, we're quite uh, excited about the retail expansion of crypto. So online commerce is now uh, being unlocked with the crypto payments. Uh, we partnered with Now Payments and Shopping.io to put uh, Zill in shopping carts and, and uh, transactions across the web. So that's definitely something which is being adopted dramatically. And as we move forward into uh, digital ID, certification, all of these things are quite exciting because it enables people to have that verified, provable uh, certificate for anything that they are providing uh, up to and including invoices. So you can actually put invoices on the blockchain and have that verified. And that's something which uh, hopefully will reaffirm that a business is uh, credible and that uh, the assets can be seamlessly swapped between entities uh, for closure, i.e. paying the asset and confirming that it's being paid. That could also be a great underlying foundation for credit on blockchain. Since there's no way to use a credit score, not that we'd even want to from the legacy system, if you've got invoices on chain, you can simply show that you're and prove that you're paying everything on time and be given uh, access to more capital based off of that. So I think that's a great use case, especially for business. Let's talk a little bit about the Zill token. What is its function in the ecosystem? Um, and how is it created in terms of is it is it proof of stake? Is it proof of work? You know, give us the history of it. Yeah, so we have uh, two elements to this. Uh, we have a proof of work uh, access. So to join uh, the network, you need to go through a proof of work process. And when you've uh, completed that process, we generally use um, PBFT. So that's our mechanism for overall consensus for um, recording the transaction to the blockchain. So it's a combination consensus strategy. This is uh, meaning a very low carbon footprint. Uh, we mine literally one minute every two hours. So uh, we have quite a, a good uh, carbon footprint and that's something we're gonna improve on this year, hopefully trying to become carbon neutral. Interesting. With the push to become carbon neutral, seemingly everywhere, I mean, I went on Google flights yesterday and now I can sort flights by their carbon emission amounts. And I said, what in the world? <laughs> this is really becoming a big deal. Now I was a little bit late to get into the NFT game. Didn't really want to accept that this was a thing that was here to stay, but I'm glad it is. It's doing a lot of people a lot of good, but I was late to that. I'm a little bit late to the whole carbon emissions things too. What narratives are you hearing or seeing or reading that's made you guys decide to go this route? 
Well, of course, there was a lot of flack uh, for Bitcoin when Elon Musk made that uh, kind of U-turn on, on uh, the status of, of the network and the fact that it did use so much uh, power consumption and that he felt that that was not in alignment with his, his goals, uh, his mission. Uh, and since that uh, time, there has been a huge effort for many uh, alternate blockchains to talk about uh, becoming uh, carbon net zero and of course, clean NFTs. So having NFTs, which are also uh, carbon neutral. So uh, it, the narrative has been picked up, particularly by artists that are very sensitive in that arena. And, and when they're producing artwork and putting it on the blockchain, they do not want to see an environmental cost or an additional environmental cost beyond what computers already use. So it's definitely a huge shift in sentiment towards making sure that those companies that are working in the blockchain space are aware of the potential difficulty with emissions-based uh, outcomes and that they address those uh, head on and hopefully make themselves carbon net zero. How does, I mean, maybe, I don't mean to put you on the hot seat. You can simply say pass on this one. We'll, we'll edit it out. But as someone who doesn't know a lot about carbon energy and stuff like that, I'm thinking, you know, well, you've got Apple over here putting out new phones every year, creating tons of wastes with obsolete devices and using up all the memory chips. Same thing with Samsung. Tesla is putting out new cars every year. There's Everyone's putting out new cars and new models every year and making technology more and more obsolete, quicker and quicker and quicker. Yet they want the rest of us to tighten our belts and use less energy so they can consume more. Is that incorrect or are they also moving and shifting their philosophies of ways of doing business yeah at a macro level moving towards sustainable uh, manufacturing is very important i'm sure for these companies trying to use as many recycled products as possible also very important for these companies so eventually even uh, the plastics will be recycled endlessly and therefore not so damaging for the environment in terms of what's happening with landfill and, and our oceans and so on and so forth. In terms of an absolute comparison, yes, it's kind of odd that the spotlight has fallen on the blockchain industry and that all of us have to focus on this specific requirement to become uh, carbon neutral. But I assume that comes from the fact that it's a choice. We could choose to use you know, heavy graphics cards and drive massive power consumption in these mining farms which have sprung up around the world and therefore we can choose to use sustainable forms of energy to power that so if you can make that choice you are now required to make that choice and i know there are reports out there that saying 70 percent of the energy used is sustainable so i'm quite sure that uh, the industry is going to get there and find a way to articulate to the public that it's not as bad as they think it is well, the whole mission of crypto in general is to use technology to make the world a better place. So it doesn't surprise me that crypto and blockchain would be the forefront of sustainable power. In fact, Bitcoin's whole game theory as a miner is about lowering your power cost. To even compete as a Bitcoin miner, you have to be using sustainable, renewable energy, or you're not going to be in business very long. Uh, but there's still ways to use even less power and that depends on different mining algorithms there's some that use just the memory chips in a computer as opposed to heavy computation and these memory chips use maybe one percent of the energy of a, a general bitcoin miner so i would like to see more um, more networks migrate to that sort of mining i think it would be even more competitive for everyone as well i don't know if bitcoin will ever change or if uh even if someone forked Bitcoin and they tried to do that, if everyone would adopt it, but it's simply worth a try. So that's pretty cool. How does a company decide like finally they're carbon neutral? Is there some kind of certification board that has to come do an audit or how does that work? Yeah, I think there are various um, associations that are doing this. There's cert certainly um, activist investors who are doing it. There are specialists and uh, people who are scientific geniuses who are working out formulas for calculating all of this carbon emission and carbon offset. We actually have a community member who's uh, produced a, a very interesting scientific level report 
to show exactly what Zilliqa does in terms of its carbon footprint. So we were blessed to have someone who's a specialist in that area, uh, who's researched uh, sustainability for years, actually put his scientific mind and put a, a document together which explains his view of what our footprint is. So it's a combination of individual activism, uh, association activism, government activism. Obviously, the UK government had that conference recently. So there's a lot of pressure on uh, governments and corporates to do better. Well, as a carbon-based life form myself, I also need to reduce my footprint and get in the gym here. So I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but um, just a couple of final questions for you. What do you guys see as far as the future of public blockchains when um, the central bank digital currencies start to roll out? Is there a lot of competition to try and be used by some of these coins to kind of run wrapped tokens in a, a legal manner? Or do you think they're going to have their own proprietary thing? Are there any rumblings or rumors that you've heard? Well, we have this combination strategy, which we see uh, China, of course, is 100% controlled and, and managed uh, by their own um, BSM. Uh, we look at uh, stable coins as an alternative uh, way of providing uh, effectively a, a digital dollar, which doesn't isn't volatile. So that's working on uh, many public blockchains. And then there's this kind of uh, permission based uh, currency, which banks are doing on a case by case basis. So it'll be interesting to see which banks, central banks choose which blockchains, uh, whether they're permissioned or public. Uh, and yes, we as a company and as a blockchain are very interested in, in providing the infrastructure for these projects. And so we just uh, pitch to the various RFPs that are out there when, when they become uh, available. Interesting. And finally, before we let you go, the final question, if this is uh, the very first virtual summit that someone brand new to crypto is listening to, can you give them just some words of wisdom uh, before you take off and get to work for the day? <laughs> yeah, well, volatility, volatility comes, comes with the uh, job. You have to think about the long term, what the fundamental importance is of peer-to-peer -peer transactions, of uh, third party uh, solutions which can underpin an industry in a way where trust is uh, done algorithmically. So you have to trust the maths, you have to trust the technology, and you have to believe that uh, tokenization is going to be the single biggest thing for our planet in the next generation because every single thing can be tokenized. So you do need to get with the program, you do need to understand what tokens can do for you, both in terms of investment in terms of utility and usage, and in terms of innovation and creativity. So I'm very excited to see uh, things like social tokens taking off. Each one of us can issue our own tokens. People can invest in us as individuals. We can trade with other individuals. And so it's incredibly freeing. It's like uh, democratic capitalism in action. It's very true. Um, I even came up with the concept for tokenized call queues for tech support in uh, a meeting earlier. And I thought, wow, this. Could actually work. Um, and as far as tokenizing ourselves, we can do so on a platform called BitClout, which is uh, kind of a replacement for Twitter, but it's all tokenized. You're automatically create your own token. You don't have to do anything but sign up. Uh, and then people can buy and sell and trade you. And it's, it's wild. So it's a fun time to be alive, Colin. You got it. Uh, we have a partner called Dex Academy who's doing this for some of the biggest influencers in the world, like uh, Mr. Beast and, and KSI. And I, I just, I think this is where it's all going. Wow. Well, we'll definitely have to uh, have you back on next year for uh, more great updates. Perfect. Love to be here. Thanks so much, Colin. All right, everyone, we'll be right back with another great guest in just a moment. <laughs> 